Let me say thank you all for coming out tonight, and thank you, David and Jody, for inviting me to Le Grand. Um, I've been trying to get here for 25 years, I think, um, and I was complaining to them that Le Grand isn't on the way to any place else. And they said, oh, yes, it is. Uh, but I have high hopes of coming back, and soon. Um, I live in Tennessee these days, but I grew up in a little town um, a little bit south of here in California in the San Joaquin Valley. <clears throat> that was a long time ago. Um, as I think of it now, that was in a previous century. <laughs> uh, uh, the town has the preposterous name of Ivanhoe. Um, and I don't know, I suppose there are places in the world where nothing changes from generation to generation, but I've never found one of those places. And it's certainly not true of this town that I grew up in. Um, to me, this is what we do when we, when we write stories. We try to capture a place or a time um, on the page. And writing then becomes a great exercise in nostalgia, in a way. As we, we try to be fair to the people in places that may not even exist anymore. I've read most of the stories in this collection to an audience, but I'm going to read one tonight that I've never read aloud before. It's titled Wedding Day. Um, there's a fair amount of irony in the story. It's based on a wedding day incident I remember from 50 years ago. <clears throat> uh, it's based on that. Uh, I'd written the story and published it in one of the little magazines, and then about four or five years ago, uh, two young people who I liked very much asked me if I would officiate at their wedding. <clears throat> well, when someone asks you if, if you will officiate at their wedding, what are you going to do? I said, yes, of course. <clears throat> and after that, I think I've officiated at five more. <clears throat> and each time I do one of the, these weddings, which I charge $7.50, <clears throat> um, each time I do one, I think, gosh, I hope they've read my, my stories, but maybe not this one. <laughs> <clears throat> and you'll see why. So it's titled Wedding Day. In the last light of the afternoon, Gerald Michaels lay on his bed in his slacks and white shirt and thought about the wedding he would perform that evening. The girl's name was Grace. She was plain, and her brown hair was oily, and she spoke with a lisp, but she had a sweet smile. She reminded him of the girls he had seen in the 60s, hundreds of them, who had run away from farm towns in the valley to wander through the parks of San Francisco. He had been a student then at the Bible College in Anaheim, and he had taken a long weekend one October to drive north thinking about what it would be like to witness to those girls or to sleep with them, too confused, finally, to do either one. Because he was Grace's pastor, he had been to the girls' house on three occasions for heavy dinners of pork and mashed potatoes, always wishing there was a man present to talk to. The house belonged to Esther, Grace's grandmother, an immense, olive-skinned woman with hard, dark eyes. Grace's mother had died when Grace was eight years old, leaving the girl and her younger sister in Esther's care. Now, late in the afternoon on her wedding day, Grace would be dressing in the back room of Esther's house. Michaels could picture Grace in the church just before seven o'clock when the guests would arrive. It was the only church the girl had attended. The weddings he had performed there were all she would have to go on as she imagined what her wedding should be like. He tried to remember his own wedding, but could only vaguely recall standing with his wife wet field, shivering while a minister he hardly knew stumbled over a passage from Ecclesiastes. In the seven years he had pastored this church, he had never canceled a worship service, but he had been glad to cancel this evening service for the sake of the wedding. He had nothing new to say from the pulpit, and most weeks he knew he was rambling, telling pointless stories about his own daughter or about baseball, which he had once loved. It was difficult enough on a Sunday morning. By Sunday evening, 
the words he hoped to use felt as heavy as the air in the church, burdened with the scent of floor wax and old hymnals. A few outspoken members of the congregation wanted him to leave. Some days, he thought about his future with sadness and uncertainty. Other days, like a middle-aged pitcher sent to the showers, he felt the sweet anticipation of release. When Pastor Michaels had first moved to Ivanhoe, Grace team. She'd reminded him of a quiet young girl he had known at his first church in Salinas, a girl who had a smile for everyone and who was certainly smiling, if only for herself, on the day she was struck by a car while riding her bicycle. The accident happened in February, and Michaels went to see the mother and the father of that other girl, who was dead, on a rainy morning when the roadside puddles were swelling onto the highway. The father of the girl from Salinas had turned to him, hoping for words a father could make sense of. And Pastor Michaels had shared his thoughts about God and his mercy. But standing in the man's living room, Gerald Michaels felt doubt open up inside of him, a door that led down to a basement. Within a month, he had resigned his position in Salinas, and he and Letty had taken a long break, a sabbatical. Eventually, though, he had come back to the ministry, and the ministry had brought him back to his wife's hometown, to Ivanhoe. The Ivanhoe church was small. He hoped enough people would come to Grace's wedding to fill the place. The girl's family hadn't sent out invitations, though Grace would have loved those small white cards wrapped in tissue paper, the words written in gold, Grace Marshall and Orlin Newberry. There was no money for anything so fancy as that. On such short notice, he hadn't taken any special steps to prepare the church. When other girls had their weddings, the girls or their mothers, someone, taped up a thick piece of yarn, a rope, to reserve the first two pews for family. Grace didn't have much family. He wondered if he should tape up the yarn anyway, slip his shoes on and walk to the sanctuary. It would only take a moment. But alone in his room, he felt as if he couldn't leave his bed, as though a large liquid weight was pressing the back of his head into his mattress. He couldn't remember where some yarn would be, some tape. He thought about calling Grace's grandmother to do it. It was too easy to imagine that house, Grace in her bedroom, Esther rocking silently beside the ancient television set. And Michael didn't want to talk to Esther Marshall. The old woman would tell him, proud of her poverty, how they all planned to walk to the church a little before seven. She would say there wasn't time for her to do anything about the pews. When Esther had stood up that morning, filling the aisle and clutching an enormous black purse, Michaels had seen the smile playing at the corner of her mouth. With her announcement, she was settling an ancient feud with some other old woman or starting a new one. My granddaughter Grace will be married this evening, said Esther. Dear God, said one of the others, and it hardly sounded like a prayer. A hymnal fell to the floor. We know it's sudden, said Esther, but with Orland in the military, there isn't time to wait. She sat down, then stood again before the others could catch their breath. You're all invited, she said. <clears throat> For the third time that afternoon, Grace took the long white dress out of her closet and held it in front of her at her bedroom mirror. She didn't know whether it was time to put the dress on or if she should carry it on a hanger to the church. If she dressed now, she would have to walk carefully on the edge of the road, holding the hem of the dress off the ground so it would stay clean. It had not rained in months, and the dirt beside the road would make a thick, fine powder. The dress belonged to her cousin, Vivian. Grace wasn't as tall as her cousin, 
and her breasts and hips were larger than Vivian's, but it was a forgiving kind of dress. Vivian had picked it out for her own first wedding. Grace wished she had one of those long plastic bags from the dry cleaner. She didn't want to walk down the road with the dress on a hanger for everyone to see, walk past someone like Miss Whitefield, who would choose that very moment to be out watering the dried up grass in her front yard. The woman wouldn't be able to keep quiet. Where are you going, Grace? What's that you're carrying, some kind of parachute? Grace didn't think she could stand it. She found a large brown bag from Save More and folded the Grace into it as neatly as she could. She wondered what Orland would wear. The part about him and the military wasn't true exactly. Orland planned to join the army in a few months. He had looked everywhere for work, but he couldn't find anything in Visalia or Tulare or even up in Three Rivers. And he was pretty sure he could still get in the army. It was too bad he wasn't already in the army. He could wear his uniform the way Terry Beasley's husband wore a uniform when Terry got married. It looked nice that way, though Terry Beasley's husband died in a car accident later. A uniform looked good at a funeral, too. Esther had offered to lend Grace a pair of shoes, black pumps with a medium heel. Her grandmother was in the bath, or Grace would not have gone through Esther's closet without asking first. When she found the, the shoes, Grace carried them to her own room to try them on. They pinched her toes, a feeling Grace knew she would never forget. She would remember every detail of this day. When she walked across the room, the shoes were awkward, but Grace knew she would get better at it the more she practiced. She gathered up her hairbrush and lipstick and the bag with the dress in it, and she called out to let Esther know she was going. I'll meet you there, said Grace. I'll be in the Sunday school rooms. Grace heard the water shift in the tub as her mother sat up, as her grandmother sat up. Don't be late, called Grace. And she ran out the door, watching her feet cautiously, as though they were small dogs running loose ahead of her. By the time she got to the church, Grace was ready to throw her grandmother's shoes into the weeds of the vacant lot next door. The shoes refused to make allowances for the shape of her feet, and Grace knew she had blisters forming. When she found the front door of the church locked, she took off Esther's shoes and her white socks and ran barefoot like a schoolgirl through the dirt and across the thin grass to the parsonage where the pastor's wife let her in, smiling uncertainly. Grace hurried past Letty Michaels, down the familiar hallway to the back of the church. In the children's Sunday school room, she shut the door and pushed a chair against it. She looked at the watch she carried in her pocket and saw she was an hour early. It was Orland's watch. He had given it to her one night and told her as long as she had the watch in her pocket, she couldn't kiss anyone else. Grace draped her dress across two folding chairs and sat down on a third to compose herself. Today, I'm getting married, she said. It didn't have the same force as when her grandmother had stood up in the church. My granddaughter Grace will be married this evening. Grace had been thrilled to hear the coughs, the gasps, really, of the other women who sat big as mountains in their pews. Esther Marshall might be slow and quarrelsome, but she could move mountains. She was a mountain herself, but she was slow. Oh my God, everything in life was slow. Grace thought the watch Orland had given her must need a new battery. The hands quivered, but when she looked at them again, they hadn't moved. It made her wish she had someone to talk to, a maid of honor. She hadn't mentioned a maid of honor to Orland. They should have planned better. The way it happened seemed sudden to her now. Of course, she had known Orland a long time, two years at least. He was younger than she was in high school. 
but then he stopped going, so it didn't matter. Before he quit, he belonged to the FFA, and when he got his jacket, blue corduroy with a single patch, that was the time Grace noticed him. The jacket brought out the blue in his eyes. He didn't pay attention to her in high school, which was why it surprised her so early that summer when she had been out of school for a year to have Orlin come around in the evenings. He wanted to take her for a ride, but his car had broken down. He was looking for another car, the same make and model, so he could buy it for the engine. Orlin was smart that way. They walked to the Jolly Cone one night for a milkshake, and Orlin kissed her and slipped his hand in her blouse. She wouldn't have minded the thing with his hand if he had moved a little slower. When she pushed him away, she did it by instinct, the way a few years earlier she might have knocked a boy down on the playground, some boy who had tumbled into her dizzy off the merry-go-round. She thought she had chased Orland off, but two nights later he came back. They kissed behind a tree in the front yard so her grandmother wouldn't know where she was. This time, she kept hold of both his hands. He pressed her against the smooth bark of the tree, and that part felt nice. Then her grandmother turned on the porch light, and Orlin slipped out of the yard, leaving Grace with a weakness in her legs and the feeling she had misplaced something. What were you doing out here? her grandmother asked. It had been hot all day, over a hundred by noon and Grace's arms were sunburned from standing too long in the yard, staring up the road. The evening had brought a faint breeze and the smell of the orchards. Nothing, said Grace. We weren't doing nothing. What did he say to you? Nothing, said Grace. And she ran around the tree and into the house. In the Sunday school room, she decided to get dressed. Grace turned her back to the portrait of Jesus over the piano and wished her sister, Lisa, had come along to help. She wanted to be nicer to her sister, who was four years younger than Grace and prettier. Lisa did better in school, too. Grace knew she and Lisa didn't have the same father, although nobody talked about it. Grace couldn't remember her father. She remembered a time when she lived with her mother in an apartment over the barber shop on Main Street. And she could remember the day they loaded everything they owned into the back of a man's green pickup and drove the few blocks to her grandmother's house. It took two trips. When Lisa was born, her mother married the man with the pickup, Brady, and he moved in with them. But Brady fought with Grace's grandmother, fought every day until he finally left. He said he was going to Texas and he was going to send for his family. Grace never knew if he meant to include her or not. She waited for years, afraid she would have to go with her mother and Lisa to Texas, afraid they would leave her behind. She couldn't relax about Texas until her mother died. Grace thought about running home to get her sister, but she had the white dress on now and the clasp earrings, and she had combed her hair, wetting down her bangs so they would stay in place. She looked at Esther's shoes again and hated them. Maybe no one would notice if she got married in her socks. They were white socks. She wondered if Orlin would notice. And she thought about how he had come to see her night after night since the beginning of summer, how her grandmother started bringing her rocking chair onto the porch so the woman could rock and complain and ask Orlin questions. Sometimes he barely stayed half an hour before he went away. What does that boy want? Esther said one night, as if I had to ask. What he wants is for nosy old women to mind their own business, said Grace, knowing she would be slapped for it later. She ran out into the road after Orland, who was gone. That was the night he came back. She loved the memory of it, 
waking up afraid, not knowing who it was at first, someone throwing pennies at her window. When she looked out, she saw him kneeling near the house, out of the moonlight. She could see the board fence at the back of her grandmother's yard, and beyond that, darkness to the very edge of town. He wanted her to come out to him. Go away, she whispered. They'll wake up. Then let me in, he said. I can't, she said. She wanted more than anything to raise the window and let him come into her room. My sister, said Grace. She pointed at the sleeping figure in the other bed. Where's that old woman, said Orlin. She's a damn terror. A light came on in the front of the house. As quick as Orlin had appeared, he moved away through the bushes, walking funny, all bent over so he could keep in the shadows. Grace got back into bed in a rush. When her grandmother looked, for a, looked in a moment later, Grace pretended to be sleeping. Esther moved to the window and looked out into the night. Grace held her breath, trying to imagine what her grandmother saw out that window. The mulberry tree, the alley, the long black car that had not moved in years. I know how to deal with this, said Esther. She grasped the window on either side and shut it hard as if she didn't care if Grace were awake or asleep. She did not look at Grace in her bed, but left the room, closing the door behind her. The church parking lot slowly began to fill with cars. Grace watched the people arrive from behind a long, dusty curtain. More women than men, but that didn't surprise her. Everyone was dressed up. All these people had come to church for her to see Grace Marshall get married. She imagined the presents they would bring, sheets and towels, maybe a small frying pan. All of these things would belong to her now. She was getting married. The people in the churchyard looked tired and wrinkled. Most of them had put the clothes back on they'd worn to church that morning. The door from the hallway opened, and Mrs. Michaels stepped in, Bobbing her head and smiling, the preacher's wife reminded Grace of a small child playing a game. Here you are, said Mrs. Michaels. I've been looking for you. She held an orange flower by the stem, a poppy, and she wanted to pin it on the shoulder of Grace's dress. I guess it's okay, said Grace, wondering if her cousin Vivian would find the pinhole in the dress later and complain about it. Don't you look nice, said Mrs. Michaels. Grace hoped she was telling the truth. She wished she could keep her swollen feet out of sight. What's the matter? Don't your shoes fit? They're grandma's, said Grace. I've got some slippers, said Mrs. Michaels. I'll run get them. Nobody will know. Is Orland here yet? Who? Orland. He's my... He's going to be my husband. The word sounded funny. She hadn't used it before. He can't come back here, said Mrs. Michaels. He can't see the bride until you're all in the church. She went out of the room after her slippers. I just wanted to know if he was here, said Grace. It had been Tuesday night when Orlin came again, and Esther brought her chair right out into the yard, although she couldn't rock half so well on the brown, uneven grass. What do you want, cried Grace, wishing she was brave enough to curse her grandmother. Why can't you leave us alone? So tell me, said Esther. She looked Orlin in the eye. Do you plan to marry this girl? Mary, said Grace, her voice rising too high. Well, what if I do, said Orlin. He was staring right back at Esther. Grace could hear faint voices drifting through the night from the jolly cone, a country song on the jukebox that sat outside by the picnic tables where Grace and Orlin had shared their milkshakes. Yes, said Grace, that's right. What if he does? That's the way it is then, said the old woman. 
What if it is, said Orlin. Let's set the date, why don't we, said Grace's grandmother. Then will you leave us be, cried Grace. Then will you go away. But Esther wasn't listening to Grace. All of her attention was on the boy. Hell, said Orlin, I'm ready right now. Sunday week, said Esther, in the evening. We can wait till then. You get the license. The jukebox had stopped playing. Now it started up again, the same song, the same woman's voice. It was somebody's favorite. I'll do it, said Orland. You can use our church, said Esther, unless you have one of your own. Your church is fine, said Orland. Grace felt her blood had turned to air, as if it was rushing up to escape through her ears and her eyes. Now go away, said Esther. We'll see you a week from Sunday, seven o'clock. A woman laughed from the jolly cone, and a man said, three for a dollar, I'll not pay that his voice full of disbelief. Esther wasn't rocking anymore. Go away, said Orlin, but I said I'd marry her. That's 10 days from now, said Esther. That's not tonight. She set her chair in motion again. The legs of the rocker creaking with the strain of her body, regular as the metronome Esther kept on the piano in the front room. Orlin sat for another half hour, staring straight ahead angrily into the night. And Grace sat next to him, afraid to so much as reach out and take his hand. I'll be going now, said Orland, when he had stayed long enough to make his point. He pressed his watch into Grace's hand and stepped off the porch and out of the light. The cloth slippers Mrs. Michaels brought were small too, but if Grace bent the heels down and pulled the front of the slippers tight, she could get by. Mrs. Michaels had been a week in the hospital in Visalia, and Grace wondered if she had bought the blue slippers to wear after her surgery. Do you want me to play the piano? asked Mrs. Michaels. But wait, said the woman. Do you still play, Grace? Maybe you should play. Mrs. Michaels had given Grace piano lessons for four years. She gave all the children lessons, charging $3 a week and leaving a plate of fresh cookies beside the piano at Christmas. What am I thinking, she said. You can't play this evening. You're the bride. Could you play, said Grace. I think I can, said Mrs. Michaels. I'm better now. She pushed her hair into a small bun at the back of her head, and Grace noticed one or two gray streaks that seemed to have appeared only yesterday, looking as though they wanted to escape. I'll see if the young men have arrived, said Mrs. Michaels. She gave Grace a quick hug, and then before she could slip away, the door was filled by Esther, who peered in at Grace as though she had never seen the young woman before. Whose dress is that, said Esther. Is that Vivian's? It's Grace's dress, said Mrs. Michaels, at least for today. It looks good on her, too. But it didn't matter what Letty Michaels said. It was Esther's opinion that counted. Turn around, said Esther. Let me see. Grace turned around slowly. Don't you have a slip, said Esther. No, said Grace. She thought she would cry because of it. You look fine, said Esther. The words surprised Grace. She threw her arms around her grandmother's neck. Is he here yet? It was her grandmother who said that too. Grace heard the voice as if it came from deep inside the old woman. I'll go and see, said Mrs. Michaels. <clears throat> In the room where she had first learned the stories of King David and Jonah and Judas Iscariot, Grace stood next to her grandmother, the woman who had raised her. The pastor's wife had returned just long enough to inform them that Orland had not arrived yet. Then she had settled in at the piano, 
playing one of the sweeter hymns Grace sometimes sang in her room at night when her sister Lisa was at a friend's house. Mrs. Michaels wasn't the regular church pianist. She only played four songs, and she got flustered once and had to start over. Pastor Michaels knocked on the door and waited until he was asked into the room. He wore a familiar gray suit with a handkerchief in the pocket. It made Grace wonder again what Orland would wear. When she pictured him, all she could see him in was his FFA jacket. The pastor's gray suit was nice, but she wished he would find a way to look happy. He might have been preaching at a funeral. We usually have a rehearsal, he said. What can go wrong, said Esther. Short and sweet, let them say I do and we can all relax. Esther Marshall, said the pastor, I hope you know what you're doing. Grace didn't know why that made the tears come again. Let her cry a little, said Esther. A few tears at a wedding, that's nothing new. Do these children have rings for each other? Asked Pastor Michaels. Oh, said Grace. She had forgotten about rings. Orlin hadn't said anything about them. She felt a swelling inside of her as if she might burst. Here, said Esther. The old woman's face turned a muddy red as she handed the preacher her own thin gold wedding band. That ring has been in the family, said Esther. It's the best kind. Grace hugged her grandmother, and the preacher slipped the ring into his coat pocket. Go see if the boy's here, said Esther. It made Pastor Michaels frown to be spoken to that way but he went out into the hall without talking back. As soon as he's here, said Esther, we can get started. <clears throat> At 7.30, after playing hymns for half an hour, Letty Michaels played the first chords of the wedding march. Grace's heart leaped into her throat. She clutched Orlin's watch in her hand and listened carefully for the familiar notes again. But the pastor's wife returned to the first of her four hymns, Mrs. Michaels played cautiously after that, and the more she played, the less it sounded like she was practicing for a future occasion. When she had played through all four songs once more, she began a new one, a song Grace knew well. That's Silent Night, said Grace. I guess it is, said Esther. She took a handkerchief out of her purse and wiped the sweat that it collected on her forehead. It's July, said Grace. I'm glad she's playing a different song, said Esther. I was getting tired of those others. They sat and fanned themselves until Orland's watch said a quarter to eight, and Grace couldn't wait any longer. Esther led her down the hallway toward the sanctuary, where they stopped just outside the door so Esther could look in to see if the boy was sitting in one of the front rows with or without one of his cousins or uncles for support. Oh, hurry, Orland, murmured Grace, happy that she had the watch to hold tight in her hand. Don't make people wait. She knew how much her grandmother hated to wait. It was the reason for the scowl on Esther's face. Grace studied the watch. When nobody was looking, she set the minute hand back half an hour. But she knew what she had done, and she made herself reset it to the proper time. At one minute after eight, with Orland an hour overdue, Pastor Michaels passed her on his way out the side door for a breath of air. The children inside had grown restless, and their mothers sent them out front to play in the churchyard. Esther encouraged Mrs. Michaels to take a break from the piano, but Letty didn't seem to want a break. She had been playing out of the new hymnal Grace watched as she took out the old Our Faith hymnal and looked through it, hoping to find something else she knew how to play. Esther sent a boy to the Sunday school room for a folding chair. Get one for this girl, too, said Esther. A warm breeze filtered through the church. Someone had opened one of the large doors that led to the street. Grace stole a look out into the sanctuary again. 
It was only some of the men slipping away to have a smoke. Grace had vowed not to look at the watch anymore until Orlin came, but she couldn't help herself. It was exactly 8.27 when Mrs. Michael stopped playing and came to stand before her in the hallway, her voice trembling. Pastor says I have to quit, she said. I don't care. I'll play a while longer if you want me to. Don't trouble yourself, said Esther. There has to be music for a wedding, said Grace. What kind of wedding is it without music? She looked from one of the women to the other. They wouldn't meet her eyes. There won't be a wedding, said Esther. The words went straight to Grace's heart. Don't say that, cried Grace. It's your fault. You shouldn't have said that. You've ruined everything. Straighten up, Missy, said Esther. We're not going to make a scene. He isn't coming. But Grace refused to believe Orlin wasn't coming. She wouldn't leave the church for another hour, long after the others had gone home, taking their gifts with them, long after her grandmother had told Pastor Michaels off and demanded that he return her ring. Grace sat in the Sunday school room in her cousin's dress, half aware her sister had entered the room and was sitting quietly next to her. It was Lisa who helped Grace out of the white dress, who folded it neatly and put it in the paper sack, and who led her back toward the room they shared in their grandmother's house. Lisa didn't say anything when Grace threw Orland's watch across the road into the weeds. Nor did she say anything when Grace spent an hour on her hands and knees looking for it in the dark. Gerald Michaels hung his suit coat over the door to his closet. He took his trousers off and let them fall beside the bed. He had the feeling that if he didn't lie down quickly, he might never lie down, that he would be frozen in a standing position for whatever time remained of his life. When he lay his head on his pillow and closed his eyes, he could see the boy named Orland again. How he had come up through the weedy lot at the side of the church. Michaels had been standing in the side doorway alone, and when he saw the boy, he instinctively edged out onto the steps and pulled the door closed behind him. He looked across the lot to the feed store, all its windows dark, not even a nightlight left on. Beyond that, he could see a barber pole, the one in front of Fergie's shop, still turning in the faint glow of a street lamp. The boy had arrived an hour late for his own wedding, but he acted as if he wasn't late at all, as if he was there to do someone a favor. The coat he had on fit him in the sleeves, though it billowed out around his narrow waist. He had a white shirt and a tie on, and he smelled of cologne and beer. I'm Orlin Newberry, he said. I'm here to get married. Michaels didn't smile at the boy. He didn't move off the top step. You're very late, he said. Inside, his wife had stopped playing the piano for the moment. Michaels was glad of that. When she started up again, she played a Christmas carol, which caused the boy's eyes to widen. I'm not that late, he said. It ain't Christmas. <clears throat> Michael stepped down off the landing so he could stand next to Orlin Newberry, wondering what family of criminals and idiots had set the boy loose to court a girl like Grace. He closed his eyes, filled with shame at his thoughts. He was here to take care of whoever came through the doors of the church, not just the handsome and talented ones. He wanted to reach out to Orlin and embrace the boy. He wanted to believe in him. It had slipped away somehow, the old certainty. He thought about the quiet girl in Salinas, the one who was killed by a hit-and-run driver, and he wondered if the damage had been done to him then. God hadn't spoken through him that day. Michaels had been inept with the girl's parents, cowardly. He didn't believe God had spoken through him in a long time. 
But even if he had lost faith in himself, he had always believed in marriage. Life wasn't easy for anyone. People who lived alone were the saddest of all. He had counseled many women, and men too, to stay with a poor marriage rather than risk living without another soul in the house. He thought about his own wife inside, playing the piano so these two could marry. He hoped he had made Letty happy, at least in their early years together. When he looked at Orland, at the way the boy's coat swelled out behind him, the insolent tilt of his head as he stood in the weeds between the church and the hardware store, Michael's thought about the life Orland and Grace would have, their children, the poverty of their purse and spirit. He wondered how much he, a pastor all these years, believed in anything. You listen to me, he said, though he didn't know what he was going to tell the boy. You listen good, he said. Then the words formed in his mouth without any effort on his part, and they came in a rush, and he couldn't have stopped saying them even if he had known what he was about to say. He spoke as though inspired, filled with a spirit. There's nothing for you here, he said. You better go away. His voice turned low and hoarse, surprising the boy and himself. You'll live to regret it, all of this. Go away, said the boy. I'm not going away. Don't be a fool, said the pastor. Don't open the door to regret. It's all regret after this, your whole life. I'm no fool, said the boy. I'm here to get married. Why, asked Michaels, just to get up next to that girl? You got no call to talk that way, said Orland. But Michaels knew the boy was wrong. If a man had no control over what he was saying, then he had every right to say it. Run, said the pastor. Go out across that vacant lot and run for your life. It's your only chance. What are you saying, said the boy. He was growing frightened. Here, said Michaels, I'll give you money. He took $60 from his wallet. His wife was playing hymns again, and he could hear the front doors of the church opening and closing as men went outside to have a smoke. Michaels pulled the boy closer to him, into the shadows. Take this money and go to Los Angeles. Go to Mexico. Go to Alaska. You can't marry this girl. Not Grace. Not here. I won't do it. What do you mean you won't do it? What kind of preacher are you? Can't you see, said Michaels. As he spoke, he was in awe of himself. He wondered what he would say next. I'm saving your life. I'm keeping you from an awful mistake. He caught the odor of the boy's cologne again and something else, a deeper smell of irrigation and dead leaves, of the dust of the orchards, of the earth itself. You'll never get to sleep with her. The old woman already told me that. She told you that? I don't think so. Look, you little ass. Michaels gripped the boy's arm tight above the elbow. He wanted to shake him. It was hard not to. Get the hell out of here, he said. Run away just as fast as you can. A preacher's not supposed to swear, said the boy. Listen to me, said Michaels, and he struck the boy on the head with his knuckles. This is serious. He put all the money he had into the boy's hands. Orlin looked as if he was about to cry. Go on now, said Michaels, gentle again. Don't let her catch you. That old woman will have your hide. The boy nodded, though he wouldn't have been able to say why. But he had taken the money. They both knew he would have to leave now. He wiped at his eyes with the sleeve of the jacket he had borrowed somewhere from some older friend or brother, probably dead or married himself. Orlin started to speak, but Michael shook him roughly. The boy's eyes rolled back into his head as the pastor gave him a shove toward the road. 
Michaels didn't move from the shadows of the church until Orland had crossed through the weeds to the asphalt. The boy was all but running, looking back over his shoulder in fear he would be followed. The door of the church opened and Michaels looked up at Esther's large face staring out into the night. Who's out here, she said. He walked up the steps past the woman and into the church. Oh, said Esther, it's just you. I thought it was somebody. In his room, once the Reverend Michaels lay down, he didn't have the strength to pull the blanket over him. Letty was in the kitchen talking to the cat. He didn't want his wife to come to bed. He didn't want to talk about what had happened in the church. He thought about calling his oldest daughter, who sometimes could help him explain things to himself. And he thought about calling a minister he had known years ago, someone else who might understand. But he could remember speaking harshly of that minister when the man stopped preaching and took a job as a high school teacher. He thought about the heartbroken girl and wondered if there had been a time when he would have been able to comfort her, to say the words that would restore her faith. The grandmother was a fool, and the boy was no good. That was what the girl longed to hear. She didn't want to hear about God's mercy, God's love. Michaels lay alone on his bed. He felt the heavy weight descend, pressing the back of his head into the mattress. And he tried to pray, as he tried every night, this time for grace. Thank you. I was, I was going to say something about this story. Did you notice that it has two different points of view? Right. And, and actually, I had a hard time getting it published in a small magazine. I kept getting it uh, returned to me, people saying, you can't write a story like that. And I, I kept thinking, well, I think I can. I think it's OK. <laughs> um, and so how do I choose whether to write in the first person or the third person? For me, um, if I'm really, really close to the, that narrator, I try to stay away from the first person sometimes. <laughs> because uh, if I'm really close to that narrator, I have a hard time in first person lying enough, making up enough stuff, right? The great principle of writing fiction is MSU, make shit up, right? That's it. <laughs> and, and, but it so if I shift to third person, I can do that more easily. Um, why, do, why ever write in first person? I don't know. Sometimes it just feels like what, what you should do. And yes, I have sometimes written a whole draft of a story in one voice and then said, I wonder, I, that doesn't feel right to me, and tried to do it in another voice. Um, and, and then it's, sometimes it just feels like, oh, yeah, that's what I was supposed to do all along. Did you have, who had, it? you? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> When I was a kid, about nine years old, I think, eight or nine years old, I went to the church one day for a wedding, and the guy never showed up. And I never could understand. And just my parents, we didn't talk about it. We just went home. You know, who, what, what happened? And it was one of those things. We just, we're just not going to talk about that. So later, I was trying to think, what was that all about? What really happened? And. Um, and the character of the minister who's like really struggling with his faith and maybe, maybe lost his faith. Yeah, that resonates with me a lot. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that feels familiar. Do you still have any connection with the, with the San Joaquin Valley that you visited? No, I haven't lived there since I was pretty young. My parents lived there until um, about 10 years ago. And then they moved up to the Bay Area. And my mother passed away. My, my father still 
going strong. He's 91, and I'm going to go see him next week. Um, but no, now, you know, the San Joaquin, well, Ivanhoe, California is another place that is not on the way to anything. And so um, I haven't been back in a long time. I don't, in a way, I don't want to go. I mean, I miss some of my friends, but I don't, I want to live with my made up version of the place now. Because uh, it, it, it's not like that anymore. Um, in the 80s and, and 90s, there was a whole new wave of immigration come up from Mexico. And the town uh, is now, uh, it, it feels like going to a, uh, to a small town in, in Mexico, which is really fun. I really like that. But it's just not the same place where I grew up. Yeah. Can you write about the San Joaquin Valley area? Do you feel like at all that you have to avoid things that Steinbeck wrote about? Or what you draw on? Um, I love Steinbeck. Um, the Grapes of Wrath, uh, we were told as, well, we were told as kids in, in high school that we couldn't check that book out of the library. That we, we were forbidden to check that book out of the library. Um, and the labor camp where the story ends, uh, we, we were also told, was based on a place called Linnell Camp, which was about 20 miles from where I grew up. Um, do, I try, do I try not to be... Steinbeck, I, yeah, I don't. I, I, I'm influenced by Steinbeck, I think, but also by a lot of other writers, um, Sherwood Anderson and uh, Louise Erdrich and um, James Joyce, other writers who have put together these uh, collections of um, um, connected stories. Uh, a big part of it, um, and I'm not as good as Steinbeck, so I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> terribly. So just bitter. Yeah. To speak lightly. Um, cynical of this kind of religion and the kind of um, people that are of your place or regional. You know, well, I hope, I hope not. I mean, I, I could see. I hope not. I mean, um, because I, uh, I think we all grow up in a place, and most of us think that it would be really good to leave this place and go somewhere else, right? I'll, I'll bet anyone who grew up in La Grande thinks that. I know Josh and Ezra thought that, right? Leave this town. But then when you get a little older, you realize that um, those were pretty good people, too. So I, I hope that a reader would hear the love that I also have for those characters. So it, it's ambiguous, uh, ambivalent feelings, I think. But... Um, because those people in that little town were, were you know, some of the most beautiful people I, I, I'll ever know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I saw more of your care um, towards how you felt about the characters and your tags. Um, you take, uh, after, you know, a line of dialogue or even after you introduce something that they're learning, you take a lot of care in you know, talking about, you know, going into detail about it. And so that's where I saw a lot of your care. That was because you had that personal connection with the character that you were talking about. Well, I hope so. Um, be, because yeah, there's a lot of my family in these characters, and and a lot of me in all of these characters too. Um, even in Orlin Newberry, there's a little bit of me in, in that guy. <laughs> Good. Yeah, yeah. Anyone who's worn glasses has had to, had to do that. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of my of my father in that first story. A lot of my father in that first story. Yeah. Question. Yeah, um, <clears throat> it, it's, it alternates the, um, and you know, I, you should never listen to a writer talk about his own work, okay? <laughs> but I, in my thinking about the story, it alternates the first half and the end of it are told from the pastor, Pastor Michael's point of view, and the middle part tracks grace 
and, and Orlin shows up at the end, but it's, it's, in my way of thinking, that's really Pastor Michael's story and what he did to Orlin. Um, but Orlin's a, he's a wonderful character, and, and it's, a, it's a really fun thing to do when you're writing, to, to make a character all of a sudden come alive and, and start to steal the story away, you know, and you have to let him do that a little bit. You don't want to rein him in too much. But I don't really know why I chose that, that point of view. It just, it, you, we do it instinctively, I think, and, and don't think about it too hard. Yeah. Um, you talk a lot about how you view yourself and a lot of characters, your family and a lot of the characters. Do you find it difficult as a writer to write yourself out of characters and write yourself out of your own people that you place into your work? Or is that just something that you're like, well, I am who I am, so I'm going to go put it in the story? Yeah, I don't, I don't try too hard not to let parts of me be in, in those characters, but um, I just... Again, I just just make things up, and if it, if I never let the truth interfere with a good story, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Um, like he said, the objective you're so um, versatile. The way that you can tell stories is it's great, but um... but yeah, I hear that but. <laughs> I think she's calling me old, isn't she? <laughs> uh, yeah. Not even close, but uh, just, you know, what made you feel like you could tell all these different stories? Well, I don't, I don't know if you, J Jody said I, I don't know if you heard that. It took me 30 years to write this collection. And so, yeah, um, and they've changed a lot. Um, so I guess, yeah, just years and years of work, working at something. I asked a friend of mine once, um, a writer, don't you think that writers mature later than other artists? Later, than, you know, you, you violin players playing with the New York Philharmonic or something, right? Well, you, you never find a 10-year-old novelist. <laughs> and it, it does take writers a lot longer. And so I, I asked her, I said, don't you think it takes writers longer? And she said, yes, if they're lucky. And I took that both ways. Yes, it, because it may, it may never get there, you know, but also maybe it's better off if you don't get there too soon. Um, and I do know people who had early success and, and just drove themselves crazy because they couldn't do it again. Sometimes an older musician plays a piece with <clears throat> a great deal more gravity than a 10 Yes, yes. <laughs> But, but little kids can be amazingly, Mozart, you know, with all the stuff he did when he was, what, five or six or something like that? Yeah. Way in the back. Well, thank you very much. I, that's, I appreciate that. You know, what Joyce said was that the Irish people the, and the D Dublin, people in Dublin, were paralyzed by uh, three things, by, um, by the church, the Catholic church, by uh, their poverty, and by the influence of the British, the British um, imperialism or colonialism, oppression. And he... 
that's what he felt the only thing he could do was to leave. And he did leave. But, he, but he, still, I think he loved those people because that's all he wrote about, right? Um, and I, I guess I could see that there's a certain amount of that. I, I never realized that I grew up in a poor town until years later when I moved away. And then I went back and I said, my God, these people are poor. <laughs> uh, so by getting away, I, I guess I got some perspective on it.